We are moving to a special keynote, during which you are free to put your questions to the speaker in the chat. We will then ask some of them to our guest, who is Mr. Kasper Klinge, Vice President for European Government Affairs at Microsoft. If Europe wants to be fit for the digital age, we have to remember that cybersecurity is a necessary ingredient of digital sovereignty. Microsoft being not only the partner of CyberSec, but also an important partner for governments around the world, is playing a crucial role in building the security architecture of the digital world. Mr. Klinge, once again, welcome to Cyberspace. The air is yours. Well, thanks very much, uh, Michael, and uh, thank you to the uh, Kosciuszko Institute, and it's great to be here at, uh, at CyberSec with all of you. Um, I will repeat one point that the previous speaker said before, and that is, like many of the others have said, we, we really live in unprecedented times of both challenge and, and opportunity. And I think the, the levels of social upheaval and personal trials are in many ways historic and, and driven by this combination of the pandemic and its economic and societal ramifications. But it's also driven, I think, by attention and indeed tension around the broader mega trends of globalization, geopolitical shifts, and uh, climate change. And uh, I guess one of the topics for, for today's event is that all of these topics, what transcends all of it, is in so many ways the accelerated digital transformation that we are in the middle of still today. But I think also change of the scale uh, is an opportunity, and it's an opportunity to question and potentially to shake up uh, the status quo. And therefore, I wanted to begin by recognizing that Europe, I think, deserves a lot of credit for embracing this moment and for doubling down on its ambitions and aspirations, even in times of crisis. And not least if you focus on the twin green and digital transition, but also on today's topic of uh, cybersecurity, uh, which unfortunately is a topic that I think will, will stay with us for quite some time. And I think the mindset of the European Union is very much what is needed to, to rebuild and recover after the global pandemic, both successfully, but potentially also bringing us to a better place than we are today. And I think that should be the aspiration for all of us. I think it's evident to everybody uh, that uh, the technology uh, we have as of today has played such an important role in the pandemic. Um, on the positive side, on top of being able to educate our children, uh, it has really fostered uh, a renewed focus on digitalization. It has connected people. It has also helped fight the pandemic. It has empowered businesses to continue uh, their operations, and it has allowed employees to retain their jobs by working from home. And in many ways, I think modern day technology, uh, including the one that we're speaking on today, uh, without that, we simply wouldn't have been able to cope uh, the way we have with a global pandemic with all the impacts it has had. Um, but I think it's also worthwhile to acknowledge that there is a flip side of the coin when we look at the technologies. Um, we've seen in the past year how dependent we are all are on technologies. I think the debate around uh, the digital divide is more important than ever before. And as technology has become increasingly interwoven into our lives, a company like the one I represent, Microsoft, I think have a greater responsibility in, in than ever before. And we have a responsibility for contributing to the COVID-19 recovery and to the future, if you like. But we also have, and, and I think that's the important bit here, a responsibility for addressing the concerns around technology and the role uh, the technology industry plays in our societies. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think we know better than anybody that technology runs on trust. Uh, we need to continue to ring fence and protect that trust. I guess if we look at Europe here in March 2021, it's fairly evident that the development in the last 12 months have also created a new momentum around the cause, Michael, for the word that you mentioned in your intro, digital sovereignty. It has really sort of intensified the discussions around what we mean by it and how to best achieve it. And uh, I, I want to be very frank with all of you in saying that, to me, this is not surprising at all, um, because after all, who does not want digital sovereignty? I don't think that's a European phenomenon. I think that's something that everybody around the world would basically like to have. 
So Europe's aspirations are, are fundamentally driven by valid concerns around security, around privacy, around economic opportunity, but also around mutual dependencies. And if we boil all of that down and be a little bit black and white on it, I think in many ways it's about being able to continue to being in control also in a digital 21st century. I think what I hear from, from the political leaders across Europe that we speak to on a regular basis is really a, a deep preoccupation with finding out how Europe can navigate these concerns and at the same time strike the right balance between reaping the benefits and addressing the challenges of the digital transformation. All of, it, all of this built on, on European values and Europe's, in many ways, historic commitment to open markets, um, which is one of the reasons I think the Portuguese presidency of the European Union has outlined its vision, its vision around strategic autonomy that is indeed open to the world. I think Portugal's vision of Europe's strategic autonomy does not stand in isolation. If we look back just a few weeks ago, leaders from the governments of Germany, Denmark, Finland and Estonia later followed by eight other European Union member states, sent letters to the European uh, Commission President von der Leyen, really focusing on the word digital sovereignty, uh, where they all said it's about building on our strengths in Europe and reducing our strategic weaknesses. It is not about excluding others or taking a more protectionistic approach. Um, I've had the pleasure to, to work with, uh, with the European Union for many years, and I, I actually don't recall a recent policy area where EU member states have felt it necessary to send two similar letters in, uh, in just eight days. Uh, but if nothing else, I think it underlines that digital sovereignty has become high politics and really also a battleground for de defining uh, Europe's trajectory. But I think we also need to be honest, uh, and I think the two letters uh, show that. It, it also indicates that there are many different interests at stake and not always agreement around what digital sovereignty means in practice. So I guess the big question that we should ask ourselves is, how do we define it? And I actually believe Europe is uh, uniquely positioned to find good answers to this question. Again, not only a question relevant in Europe, I think in many ways a question that we will see spread across the world. So in, in my modest view, I think Europe has a, a unique opportunity to lead the way, uh, not least based on its particular history and experience building institutions fit for the challenges of its time. And I, I would actually say that you could argue that defining a joint or a shared approach to sovereignty as it has evolved since the Second World War is in many ways exactly what the Europe pro European project is about, dating all the way back to the Treaty of Rome. So as we look for an updated concept for sovereignty in a digitally connected and interdependent 21st century, I think it's only natural that the world will be looking towards Europe for answers. Because after all, who else would be better suited to make sovereignty fit for the digital age? And I think finding the right balance between protection and openness will also avoid that one of Europe's absolute strongholds, the so-called Brussels effect as coined by Professor Anu Bradford, could lead to an inward looking trend across the world where other regions will also perhaps not reap the full benefits and the opportunities of a connected digital age. So in many ways, I think Europe has a unique and, and also a necessary opportunity to define a technological agenda based on European values and on regulatory standards, combined with setting necessary guardrails to protect democracy and the rule of law. So I think the quest for digital sovereignty is, among other things, also driven by concerns around the protection of security interests, which brings us to the topic of and I think also this makes sense. Uh, in fact, how can you have sovereignty without security? Um, and of course, this logic also applies to the digital era. And uh, boil down again, I would say that there can be no digital sovereignty without cyber security. But what does this mean in practice? Well, today, national security requires close collaboration uh, due to mutual dependencies. Technology has in many ways changed the notion of what it takes to defend a nation and today's foreign cyber weapons pose a critical threat to the future of our societies and the stability of our governments, our industries and our infrastructure. Thank you, sir. We had a little bit of a glitch. 
I have a okay. few more points, uh, Michael, if that's okay with you. Absolutely, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. No, already one year ago, um, as countries were starting to go into lockdown, we saw a spike in the number of cyber attacks from malign actors, most notably in terms of ransomware and phishing practices. And I think it's a really sad fact that cyber criminals have turned uh, the COVID-19 crisis to their own advantages. Even as healthcare systems around the world struggle with the pandemic, we have seen attacks on hospitals, on vaccine distribution operations, medicine regulations even the WHO. And we've also uh, saw how different disinformation campaigns under the global pandemic disguise were surfacing across the globe. It was clear back then, and I think it remains clear today, that we are in the middle of a pandemic, but we are also really facing an infodemic at the same time. The previous speaker spoke about uh, solo winds, and I think we can now also point to Hafnium attacks um, as really a critical wake-up call and evidence of the urgency of looking at the growing cybersecurity threat landscape. I think the response to these global threats cannot be local or perhaps not even national. It requires a commitment to effective collaboration also at the global scale. It ultimately underlines that uh, the importance of a coordinated global cybersecurity response and joint efforts from governments and from technology companies working in close collaboration is needed more than ever before. In this regard, I was really happy to hear Vice President Sheena is outlining the EU's 2020 cyber package and the ambitions that goes with it. And in Microsoft, we think that the cybersecurity package sends a very, very clear signal of the European Union's commitment to continue its global leadership on legislation addressing current and future cybersecurity challenges. If we take the NIST directive and its review as an example, I think COVID-19 has shown how essential digital technologies have become and underlined how critical the cloud is. The NIST Directive Review and the NIST 2 proposals are important tests for how we, as multi-stakeholder community, look at cloud regulation in the future and what security requirements make sense for a resilient and trustworthy digital critical infrastructure. For us in, in Microsoft, this is per definition a global and an inclusive exercise. Cybersecurity is not bound by conventional borders, and the NIST 2 directive rightly underlines that cybersecurity is cross-border, it's cross-sector, and it also highlights the importance of risk assessment and supply chain security. Let me finish up by, by summing up three elements that we in Microsoft believe will be crucial to build a more secure, a more resilient, and a more forward-looking cyberspace. First of all, multi-stakeholderism is key in enabling discussions on the cybersecurity norms in cyberspace. And that's why we've provided input to the United Nations and to the European Union public consultations, having literally just this week submitted our response to the reason is two directive consultations. Setting partnerships to ultimately defend democracy and our open societies is key. Uh, we need to boost coalitions among responsible countries across the globe who share an interest in cooperating on cybersecurity capacity building, situational awareness, and also information sharing. And third and lastly, information and expertise sharing is, as we've seen also in the latest uh, examples, unfortunately absolutely vital. We will not solve the cybersecurity related challenges, the threats through silence. It is key that we encourage and even sometimes require information and expertise sharing, including by technology is like the one that I represent. In short, promoting sovereignty by increasing cybersecurity requires more international collaboration. And in Microsoft, uh, we are therefore actively investing in cybersecurity policy and activities across the globe, not least in the European Union, where the drive and ambition to deliver, deliver cross-cutting and ambitious cybersecurity policy further motivates us to be actively involved. Let me close by applauding the uh, European Union's aspiration and the EU's ambitious digital uh, agenda. I'm a European with a capital E, but also as a Microsoft representative, it is really important for me to underline that I understand and I recognize the context driving the call for digital sovereignty in Europe. These are valid concerns and they need to be addressed. And the question is not if, but how. Um, and I also truly believe that sovereignty is not effectively achieved if it is at the expense of the openness. That also applies for cybersecurity, an area where international and cross-sector cooperation is more important than ever before. 
So technology companies must build technology that meets Europe's needs in terms of privacy, security and safety. Build on shared values, on trust, on cooperation. But it shouldn't really matter where you come from, but whether you play by the rules of the game. And we are completely committed to play by the rules of the game. We are in the tech industry uh, are the ones that need to adapt to European rules uh, and values. It is not going to be the other way around. So we're looking forward to working together with the EU institutions and other relevant stakeholders in realizing the EU's 2030 vision as set out through the EU's digital compass. We firmly believe that to make Europe fit for the digital age, we need to make technology fit for Europe. Mika, thanks very much and sorry about the glitch in the middle of this. Thank you, sir. And we have received at least a couple of questions. Um, I'll go with the first one first and then we will see if time allows for, for the second one. So the question is, where is the intersection between strategic autonomy and digital sovereignty? And what is the role of the private sector in order to address these political ambitions? Yeah, listen, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And um, I think one of the challenges that we all face is you probably get different answers depending on who you ask uh, across Europe. But, but I think if we generalize a little bit, uh, I would say that strategic autonomy or digital sovereignty is in many ways part of the same political trajectory that we're seeing across Europe. And in many ways, it is about what I said in, in, my, in my address before, it is about retaining control, being able to take decisions independently. And I think it's also about making sure that Europe will remain uh, competitive also in a world that in some ways are becoming more bipolar with uh, the US and, and Asia perhaps occupying the territory a bit more in, in the digital area. Um, Commissioner Vestager has put it in, in, a, in a way where she talks about um, you know, regulatory sovereignty, the ability for Europe to set the guardrails for itself uh, to make sure that the decisions taken in Europe adheres to what European decision makers are interested in. And I think we have to, to recognize that. I think the lesson learned, and I want to be very honest in this, is also that uh, as a big technology company, including a technology company that has delivered some of the technology that we've been so dependent on in the last 12 months, um, you know, there is a price coming with that. And that is uh, the fact that the dependency on non-European union technology is of course evident to everybody. And therefore I think one of the lessons we've learned and something that we will have to work very hard on is to make sure that we continuously adapt everything we do to what Europe wants, what Europe needs, and to make sure, which is a core part of our uh, business uh, model, that we provide the, the, the critical infrastructure, the digital infrastructure to the European economy, to small and medium-sized enterprises, to big enterprises, so that they can really prosper also in a post-COVID-19 uh, situation. But I think it would be very foolish for any of us to dismiss uh, the fact that the digital sovereignty discussion or the strategic autonomy discussion is, uh, is a discussion that is here to stay. Thank you. And I'll try to go with the second question, if that is fine with you. Uh, also because it's a very timely one. Um, so the question. The Hafnium attack has, has once again shown that our dependence on technology leaves us highly vulnerable to attacks by state actors. In your view, what can we learn from this and other recent attacks? Yeah, no, no, thanks, for, thanks for this question, Mikhail. And I know we're a little bit short on time, so I'll try and, and, uh, and answer fairly, fairly short on it. First of all, just to acknowledge what you said, I think it, it has once again revealed that there are people out there uh, that have uh, a moral compass, uh, perhaps not exactly the way that most of us think it should be, uh, sending out a text that has a huge impact on companies, on governments, on our societies. Um, and I, I think once again, it, it shows what I also mentioned in my, my keynote, that I think we need more collaboration, we need more information sharing, we need more timely information sharing for us to be able to respond to these attacks as quickly as possible. We have literally thousands of people working in Microsoft 24 seven, scrambling every time we see an attack of this nature to try and defend and protect our customers, but actually going a bit further, defending societies, democracies, um, et cetera. I would say one thing, 
I think this also shows that there is a particular vulnerability, as we've said publicly, also with on-prem uh, services. It would have been easier for us to help defend this had these services been, had this attack been carried out uh, against uh, our cloud services. So I think it also shows that um, there there is a, a trend, of course, uh, going in the direction of us focusing much more on mitigating these risks, going to the cloud, having access to state-of-the-art uh, security technology is, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, part of how we have to make sure that we continue defending our societies. I don't think this, unfortunately, is going to be the last attack that we've seen. Um, so we will continue to be open, transparent, share information with customers, but also with the broader public of what we see and what we think is going to be necessary to fix specific attacks, but also to build up resilience so that we avoid uh, dramatic ramifications of the attacks that we are very likely to see in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your answers and thank you for the keynote.